If you missed the last episode of Catalyst, go back and listen. If you're caught up, here's where we left off. The Heidi Search Center help families with missing loved ones. All right, James Jamie Mayberry. The number there means that he went missing in 1999 and he was the 84th person that we had a case on that year. And uh, these are volunteers. So they're making note, I guess, of areas of interest to search. Uh, there's another mention of an old cemetery. It sounds like the entire town really came out to search. Yes, sir, the, the city, several citizens, the Heidi Search Center came out. What was the thought that he might be in this cemetery or this area? You know, somebody trying to hide if he's deceased, you know, trying to hide his body or, or you know, try to hide evidence. It's many times the reason we save all these records and they're so important is that the people that are responsible for the missing will be there in the searches. And you can't help but think like, Yes. Um, am I walking with the killer? And that was a time uh, someone changed our direction. And I even got suspicious of that. It's kind of like they're trying to steer you away. It was that. From... I was, we were just suspicious of everything, mm -hmm. everybody. You know what I mean? Uh, well, you don't know who to trust yeah. at that point. As of today, we have no suspects. We have no persons of interest. We have. We do have one or two people that maybe can give us information that we would like to. For a family to have their loved one missing and that case to never be solved, it's hell on earth. It's torture. And I don't think unless you've been there you can understand. Trying to better understand why more than 5,600 people who've been reported missing in Texas in the last few decades are still missing, I wanted to take a closer look at a public, online, federal database that's housed here in the state, the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System, better known as NamUs. It launched in 2007, but state lawmakers actually started paving the way for its creation a few years before, during their legislative session in 2001. Chair lays out uh, House Bill 3041 and calls uh, Lance Idol. Uh, I represent myself, uh, my family, uh, as the father or stepfather of a uh, missing child. I dug up an archived audio recording of a House Public Safety Committee hearing from back then and heard Lance Idle's voice. On June the 14th of uh, last summer, 2000, uh, my stepdaughter turned up missing in, in Williamson County. Um, she was listed at initially as a runaway. Uh, she was in the area uh, for about five days, according to the police investigation, voluntarily in the area. Uh, and then after that, uh, there's been no contact with her. She is now listed as an endangered runaway. Imagine you're a parent so desperate for help in finding your missing 15-year-old, you've exhausted every avenue that already exists. So you turn to your elected officials, speaking to them directly in front of a crowd in favor of a bill you believe could help you get answers. Anytime someone loses a family member, and especially in, in a situation like this, when you don't have an answer and there's no certainty and there's no closing, eventually the shock wears off and you start trying to be as, 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 re, as proactive as you can in trying, to, in trying to locate this child. And the reality hit us that if Megan, if her remains were found, and I'm, we're just going to use an example, is in El Paso, Texas, and the only reason is because El Paso is 600 miles from Austin or from the Round Rock area, how would law enforcement authorities in El Paso know that those remains belonged in 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 uh, in the uh, it belonged to Megan and belonged to Round Rock? We went to looking and there was no central repository for DNA. Lance Idle's story had caught the attention of a freshman lawmaker that session, Representative Charlie Guerin of Fort Worth. His district included the University of North Texas Health Science Center, which was already using DNA to help the state attorney general's office determine paternity in child support cases. Tonight I stand before you and ask for your favorable, favorable consideration on, on legislation that, in my opinion, addresses an issue of somber importance in the state. To Guerin, it made sense that the university would expand its work in this area to missing persons. There's over 200 unidentified uh, bodies that we find each year in the state of Texas, some skeletal remains, others bodies, and, 
and there's just there's not a, a DNA database to pull from to identify these people. Some of them are identified, others are not. The bill required police in all high-risk missing persons cases to get with family members of the missing and try to gather their DNA, which would then be cross-referenced with any unidentified remains that turned up across the state. HB 3041 creates the University of North Texas Health Science Center at Fort Worth missing person DNA base, and it provides for the preservation and analysis of tissue samples from unidentified deceased persons. In short, this bill establishes a voluntary program for families who have been the victim of, a, of an abduction. It allows those families to have closure by determining whether skeletal remains that are found are the remains of their loved ones. Granted, this is a difficult issue to talk about, but for the families whom this bill affected, it is crucial. I think Representative Jerem brought a great bill to us, and I hope we uh, can kick this out and get it passed. Mr. Chairman, members, thank you uh, for the opportunity to present this legislation to you. And this really is something that I think that that, uh, that we can do as legislators to benefit the, the good citizens of the state of Texas, and I'd urge your favorable and speedy consideration. And Clerk, call roll, please. Turner. Aye. Keel. Berman. Aye. Driver. Aye. Gutierrez. Pup. Aye. Isaac. Aye. King. Aye. Theodore Aye. Seven ayes, two absent. Seven ayes and two absent House Bill 3041 as substituted sent to the state general calendar. The governor signed the measure to create the DNA database lab at the university a few months later. And that move actually attracted NamUs to eventually set up shop there. We're here to try to look for possible matches so that we can send these people home. Our reporter Arzo took a tour of NamUs recently and its database of nearly 16,000 missing persons nationwide. How do you make sure those cases are accurate? We vet all of our cases with law enforcement before we publish those cases. So it goes through a process. It's paid for with, you know, government funding, taxpayer dollars. Workers showed her how the DNA analysis has expanded to include fingerprints and dental records now, which remain private confidential. All of that information is restricted only to professional view and that's because that is law enforcement sensitive information. Over time, NamUs has helped resolve more than 2,200 missing persons cases across the country. It's not uncommon for us to receive cases from family members, from law enforcement agencies, from medical examiners, coroners, even the general public, concerned citizens. The public have been really helpful to look at the name and system to pass along the information. They're able to share it with other people, and that's the most important thing, getting the word out. They're going to be able to see maybe a height, weight for a person that, when they were last known to be seen, for a little bit of a description that kind of explains what happened. We've had family members of missing persons come into the NamUs database, search through the unidentified decedents, and essentially solve their own cases. They found matches to their missing person. Type in Jamie Mayberry's name, and it's clear just how comprehensive the system is. Pictures pop up, and we learned NamUs also gathered his dental records, along with very specific details from when he went missing. So if we look at Jamie's case, we can see that he was last uh, seen leaving his home with an unknown male on April 1st of 1999, and he just hasn't been seen or heard from since. It's helpful to know that Jamie did have pierced ears and that he did wear a black wig. So we have this information available if for some reason foul play has occurred. What would be the challenges for solving this case? Is the information as complete as it can be? And that's for any missing person case. Do we have all the data that we could have? Part of the reason Jamie's profile has so much data is because the Heidi Search Center made sure NamUs had everything, including DNA. We learned they'd worked with one of his sisters to gather her DNA for the system to compare with the thousands of unidentified bodies it has on file and also what we call unclaimed persons. So those are decedents who have been identified by name, but the medical examiner or coroner has not been able to locate next of kin. Jamie has been cross-referenced with 17 unidentified bodies with similar descriptions. No matches though. His case is still active. Unidentified decedent cases have some really unique challenges. Um, depending upon the condition of the remains, it's often really difficult to determine uh, race, ethnicity, hair color, eye color. It's a matter of how can we compare what we have in the database against the missing persons. 
I wondered how many missing persons NamUs had listed from Texas. About 1,200. That's a lot fewer than the 5,600 cases Department of Public Safety data shows are still active from the past 20 years. So why the difference? It's not a requirement to enter missing persons into NamUs in the state of Texas. Police in some states, New York, Michigan, Illinois, Tennessee, and recently Oklahoma and New Mexico, are all required by law to enter missing persons information into the system. But even though NamUs is headquartered in Fort Worth, Texas doesn't have that rule for its law enforcement agencies. We're a state that doesn't require law enforcement to be to participate in NamUs, and the reason that we don't is because they already do. I sat down with Representative Guerin, the lawmaker behind the original DNA law. He's still in office, and now one of the most senior members of the Texas House. He admittedly wasn't too familiar with NamUs, even though it's kind of in Texas because of his legislation. He said he assumed since police had to submit DNA in cases to the university where the system's housed, they were also submitting the other information, dental, fingerprints, profile specifics, to NamUs. I think a lot of agencies are, but the numbers tell us that not all of them are. There's 5,600 active missing persons cases in Texas right now, according to the FBI and DPS, but only 1,200 people are entered into the NamUs system. So it seems like there's a lot of people that's just in the last 20 years that are missing that aren't in the NamUs system. If I thought that we, we being law enforcement in Texas, were not participating in a meaningful manner, then I think it would be necessary for us to pass legislation that would require it. Knowing that other states are requiring law enforcement agencies to report to NamUs, do you think it's at least something Texas should explore? I think that the more information that's out there on a missing person, the more that's available, the better. And if we need to be part of NamUs in order to get police to submit the stuff, then We'll carry a bill and do that, but like, I can't imagine the emotion that those families and the stress that they're going through when someone does go missing. You know, I've got a five-year-old and a 10-year-old grandsons, and I couldn't imagine. Uh, I, I get nervous when we go to the aquarium when it's really crowded, and I'm looking, and all of a sudden that five-year-old's gone like that. And it just scares me to death. But we're going to contact Amos today, and I, mean, I appreciate you bringing this to us. <laughs> His office did reach out to NamUs and is now exploring the possibility of new legislation when lawmakers return to the Capitol for their next session in 2021. We did all the, the normal things that a family would do. We, of course, contacted, immediately contacted the police department in Round Rock. And I'm sure they started looking into it. They asked a lot of questions. We looked up Lance uh, Idle, the father who uh, spoke in favor of the bill back in 2001. I wanted to know if he'd support requiring Texas police to use NamUs. He said he probably would because he knows not all families are as lucky. His daughter was found alive. And it literally leaves a hole in your soul. And I know that because when, when, our, when our child came back, when the daughter came back, it closed at that hole, okay? But if they never come back, that hole never goes what? It's always there because you're always thinking about it. Jamie Mayberry's family's known that feeling for 20 years, and police say it will take someone coming forward with new information to close his case. That someone could be the final name in a list of suspects on Jamie's missing persons report someone police couldn't find, but we did. Next time. There is one person we'd like to talk to, I believe, who, who I would characterize as a witness at this point. Until I can actually sit down and visit with this individual to really see, okay, you said this back then, what really did happen? We're working on a story about Jamie Mayberry. I wondered if you might know him. You can get off my property right now is what you can do. Okay. Did we you have a right to bear arms, and I'm not scared to use them, so get off my property right now. Be sure to check out the interactive investigation, Mayberry, Texas, online at mayberrymissing.com. You'll learn so much more about this case and many others across the state. Catalyst is reported, produced, and edited by me, Josh Hinkle, along with Sarah Rafik, Arzo Dost, and Andrew Choate. Digital support comes from Dax Dobbs, Eric Henriksen, Nate Mills, Matt Mitchell, Ricardo Ruano, Robert Sims, and Kate Winkle. KXAN's news director is Chad Cross, and its vice president and general manager is Eric Glassberg.